Welcome to Willow Oaks Value Hour. This episode features Keith Smith of Bonhoeffer Capital and Sri Viswanathan of SBN Capital as they present a few of their holdings, including Evolution, a Swedish online gaming company, Asbury Automotive Group, a dealership group in the United States, Dino Polska, a Polish supermarket chain, and Millicom International Cellular, a cable, broadband, and mobile services company in Latin America. To receive research write-ups on these companies, email jessica at willowoakfunds.com. Enjoy the show. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, two specific companies. Let me start with the first one. My largest position in the portfolio is a company called Evolution. It used to be called as Evolution Gaming. They recently changed their name just to Evolution AB. It's a Swedish company based in uh, Stockholm, trades there. And um, what they primarily do is offer what's called as live casino options to these gaming operators. What does live casino mean? Any table game that you know of, you know, blackjack is popular in North America, roulette is popular in um, Europe, Bakra in Asia, all these traditional table games, and a whole number of new slot games that have popped up over time. What Evolution does is offer all these games with a live dealer. And uh, a number of players who have sort of caught on to this avenue of playing games online now prefer to have a live dealer. You know, it brings a level of credibility. It uh, attracts a very different set of uh, players. Uh, Both gaming operators and players have been coming to this, you know, live option at a rapid pace. And that's what Evolution does. Evolution offers these games from a number of its studios, primarily in Eastern Europe. Uh, In Europe, they've got a studio out in uh, Canada, and they now have three studios operational in the U.S. And uh, U.S. is right now its virgin territory, or the larger North America is now its virgin territory. Uh, We'll come back to that later in the discussion, I'm sure. But uh, the, the company offers these by hiring a whole bunch of 20 something guys and gals in Eastern Europe, trains them and uh, lets them lose, lets them lose as a dealer. And um, the company has uh, more than 700 tables offering its games to more than 500 customers. Approximately 40 plus of them are actually land-based casinos. Now you may think of uh, a land-based casino as a potential competitor. Uh, It still is, but more and more land-based casinos are actually partnering up with somebody like Evolution in offering their games. The company was um, founded in the 2000s. The founders are on the board. Um, Between the two founders and the original backer, they own approximately 11% of the stock, uh, very little debt, fantastic uh, capital management in terms of deploying into games and focusing on specific markets. I stumbled onto the name while focusing on a company that Evolution ended up acquiring, a company called Netent, which was its biggest competitor in Sweden. That acquisition happened in November last year. And since then, they've made two more acquisitions. So capital deployment on that front has been very, very focused on growth. And that's the mantra. The mantra of the management team is to put significant distance between itself and its competitors. And that's showing up, showing up in terms of revenue growth, operating margins, and phenomenal returns. So that's the first name that I would like to sort of bring up to your attention. I have shared my write-up with you in the past. Fire away with questions if you have any. Sure. No, it looks like a great company. The growth, the growth profile seems to be accelerating and it's done really well in sort of this new burgeoning market. What, what do you see as, in terms of trying to drill a little bit more into that growth? 
How much growth, I mean, given historically the growth has been really high, what do you expect the growth, let's say, to be over the next five to seven years? And then drilling a little bit more into that, um, what type of contractual arrangements do they have? And, and how, how does all that work in terms of the contracts they have with their customers? Because my understanding is they're, they're not really interacting with the end user, right? There's, a, there's another group of companies that actually do that and they're supplying these, these this online, sort of almost like what happened in the slot machine business where the slot machine guys provide slot machines to casinos. It sounds very similar type of a model here. So some of that, some insight into those, those um, growth aspects would be, would be appreciated. Keith, you know, you know why I like engaging with you? It's these very thoughtful questions. Um, so, you know, both are fantastic questions. Let me take a step back and uh, describe the market a little bit. Right? Europe has been far advanced in terms of coming up with regulations, technology, payment methodology, and all that. So the global gaming market is about 300 billion euros. About 80 plus percent of it is in land-based casinos. So the balance 20% is where online is. And within that, live casino is a much smaller piece, barely 6%. And the larger gaming market is growing at GDP rate, while online is growing at close to 30 some percent. Online is growing at you know, mid to high teens. The live casino segment itself is growing at 30%, and evolution is growing at more than 50%. Mm -hmm. And uh, why is that? So I tend to like monopolies and oligopolies. You know, it's the famous uh, Peter Thiel statement from his uh, uh, zero to one and his speech at Stanford where he talks about monopolies uh, you know, providing a significant return for equity holders over a long stretch of time. He goes on to great lengths in describing as to why um, you know, all companies lie, monopolists lie that they are not, and non-monopolists lie that they are. Um, so, but I, I tend to like these types of monopoly situations. The competition for evolution is very limited. You know, there's a company called Playtech in UK, and there is another company in uh, Asia called Asia Gaming, and a few smaller players who tend to, who also offer live as a part of their larger offering. Evolution offers only live. Um, in fact, uh, the acquisitions that they've made recently, they're converting slots into uh, live options as well. And that's, you know, that, that, that sort of a focus on quality of games, um, quality of uh, uh, fo you know, focus on the business to business operators um, on a global scale, that sort of provides them the tailwind for that kind of 50 plus percent growth. Um, as I said, they've made these you know, phenomenal acquisitions recently, net end oh, being- well, well, Shri, what, what prevents the other people from, what keeps them in there? Is there some kind of regulatory barrier that prevents other people from going in there? How about no, start a actually, company? What's going to prevent that? That what's the? Yeah, um, you know, uh, it's a question that keeps popping up um, mm -hmm. in all my discussions. Yes, nothing. You know, the uh, uh, barrier to entry is low, but barrier to execution is high, and that's how the management team thinks about this. Um, what do I mean by barrier to execution? I mean this business entails not just putting a kid in front of a camera and having him or her uh, start dealing cards. Uh, it is that, but it also involves good connectivity, resolution, payment technology, rules and regulations for what should be done, should something go wrong while the game is on. And um, all that has sort of evolved, particularly over the last five years, uh, five to seven years. You know, uh, the 5G technology is one of them, uh, payment technologies um, moving um, across various different continents is another one. So um, all that uh, sort of uh, lends to evolution's you know, strength. Why can't somebody else do it? Well, Playtech and uh, Asia Gaming and a few others do try to offer it, but live is not the primary focus. It's one of their offerings and it shows up in the kind of quality. Um, the, uh, you know, the type of customers that uh, uh, Evolution has, you know, think of a DraftKings um, or a FanDuel 
you know, two big names that I can come up with in the US, but there are a many number of uh, you know, customers from Europe and Asia that also uh, have signed up with, uh, with Evolution. Um, it's, a, it's a game where, you know, it's a game where the two or three other players in the space are constantly chasing evolution. And that's why that phrase that management comes up with, you know, putting distance between itself and its competitors is actually very real. It's very real. And that shows up in all aspects of its operating results. Well, one, one last question. How far of a lead do you think um, evolution has? And, and it sounds like you, you think it's, it's growing. What's sort of the magnitude of that at this point? Yeah, that is uh, continuing to grow. Um, okay. In fact, um, you know, as a quick uh, uh, factoid or a tidbit, I would say, you know, there's a gentleman by the name of Todd Hauschalter. He's actually an American. Um, he used to be the head of gaming in uh, Bellagio. He moved to uh, Europe, Eastern Europe, uh, now spends time in uh, Riga, Latvia, which is where the company has one of its biggest studios. And his daily um, responsibility is to continue to think about quality games. Um, they currently offer close to 40 games. You know, there are these traditional board games that I discussed. There are um, other, uh, you know, slot games that they've come up with. TV uh, shows like Deal or No Deal that have been translated into um, online live casino games. So his daily responsibility, I'm sure it's not just him alone. He has a massive team under, under underneath him, but the mm -hmm. primary focus is on coming up with these types of quality games. And that again shows up in the number of games and the quality of games that these guys come up with, which forces everybody else to sort of start chasing them. Um, and so the lead that uh, Evolution has put together is quite significant and it's continuing to expand. Okay. Can somebody else come in? Yes, um, anything can happen. But um, at this point, uh, competition, which is one of my uh, important areas of focus in a high growth name like this, continues to be um, trailing far behind. Okay, great. All right, I guess I guess I'm going to be going next with my first first company, which is a company called Asbury Automotive Group. They're a traditional auto dealer. Um, they have a very innovative, I believe, board and way that they approach the auto dealership market. The, the, the auto market is a very fragmented market that's basically serviced on a local basis by local dealerships providing automobiles to, to customers within those regions. Um, uh, Asbury is really good in the fact that it's, it's the auto dealer market and Asbury in particular do excel at this in that they generate so revenue sources from a number of different, different areas. They have new car sales, used car sales, service, and, and now they're starting to do sales online via the internet. What's really interesting about this business is historically, Asbury has grown by, by buying other, other auto dealerships. And so mm -hmm. they're probably about an eight to 10% historic growth rate. And what that's done is since the focus of their acquisitions have been in local markets, they've been able to realize very large economies of scale. So as the company has grown, there's been tremendous operational leverage because it's the way the auto business works is a, it's a very local business. If you, if you try to buy dealerships across the country, you're not going to get much scale, but if you can do it within a local market, you can get scale. The biggest that's not on the balance sheet that, that I know about is management. It's much easier to manage a group of people within a given region than to try to do it desperately across the country. And so that's one of the, what, what, sort of the economies of scale that happen there. Now, the other aspect of, of, of Asbury's dealerships, which, which adds some appeal to it, is they have about 45% are luxury. And those dealerships have, uh -huh. a, have higher margins than the, the more commodity kind of dealerships. Both can do well, but the luxury dealerships is about 45% of their mix. You can actually see that in not as much in the U.S. because there's, they don't really break that out. But if you look if you go over to the U.K., look at a company like Cambria, which is exclusively um, exclusively luxury dealerships to somebody like Virtu, who is primarily a mass market. They do have some, but you, the margin difference can clearly be seen there. 
like yeah. what how, how much um, spread between the two types of businesses well like in the uk i think cambria probably has like mid single mid single digit margins and the in the more the, the more i guess they call I it see. and the average dealerships are probably low single digits so you're probably talking a a two to three percent margin difference but given the scale of these businesses and where the, the an important aspect of the auto dealership is something that's inventory turns or what's described as velocity the quicker you can turn turn cars this is like a retailing business most retail businesses the key aspect of it is inventory turns because if you can quick if you can turn inventory quicker than your competitor you can offer cheaper prices get a higher return on capital then you can. So that's right. That's part of what Asbury's appeal here is, is they do have very high inventory turns. And so compare their, their, their main competition at this point are other local dealers that don't have the scale. So Asbury has the has the margin, gets the economies of scale from that. And they also don't have the turns. And so you get those two together. And what can happen is you can get this nice flywheel because as what happens is it has a tendency to feed off itself. If you more people get they like the service. They like the local the local service that's there, and it just grows and grows and grows. So that's sort of what's happened to Asbury. If you take a look at historically, that's sort of been their base model. What's really interesting now, though, is the introduction of the internet. Now you had mentioned in, in evolution that that's pretty much how the business really sort of accelerated and really growth. It's all this internet based stuff. Well, that's exactly what's happened with Asbury here. They they have been another company called Lithia are sort of the pioneers in the in, I was called the traditional dealers and usually in selling cars over the internet. And actually what's very interesting about Asbury is they started out with zero cars over the internet at the beginning of this year. Now they sold 10% of new cars over the internet. They expect to go up to 15% by year end. And these wow. are all customers that are within their local footprints that, have, that weren't previously Asbury, Asbury customers. So these are brand new customers within their footprint. They haven't even started to think about going outside their footprint because with this with this um, you know online model, basically the incremental cost is very is basically putting the software together, and and, and after that it basically just becomes you know it it's it, the profit incremental profitability is very high. So this has been something. Lithia's noticed the same thing. Asbury's noticed the same thing. So I think this is be, is going to be a real big growth area. How this sort of works into their plan is Asbury is now expecting for the next five years to grow revenue by 20% per year with mm -hmm. half coming from the internet. You get the traditional eight to 12, 10% like they've historically done based upon this roll up and buying. They, they have a very good buy discipline. So they buy when it's when it's when when they think it's right. If they, if, if they can't find anything, then they'll buy back shares. They have a very good capital allocation. They're very unique amongst auto dealerships or probably companies in general that they actually have a capital allocation committee. The whole job of the capital allocation committee is to set the priorities. And I've been talking with other investors about this. One investor put it really well in that they've defined it so well that in essence, the question is just execution. Mm -hmm. the ex basically, they go out there, they basically set up the parameters. If, if, they, if you can buy the dealership for this amount, we can see these amount of synergies. We try to look for dealerships in our local clusters. Then, then, then that's a, that's our first priority. If we can't find any, we have excess cash. Then we'll buy back shares. And then the but the first priority of all of that is the internet because of the high high returns. And they they introduced that last year to show you how much they're sort of focused on this. They had a previous system which was primarily focused on getting service appointments. They scrapped all the investment in that. Basically, at the beginning, the end of last year, they basically put together an integrated system which allows you to buy a car online. You don't even need to go into the dealership. All the all the all the the um, steps along the way you can do online. And if they need any wet signatures, they'll deliver it to your house and get your signatures there. So they've provided an offering that's comparable to Carvana in terms of an online offering. But then, in addition, you've got a service person that's there. If something goes wrong with the car you've got someone that you can directly talk to. So, you know, one of the questions in terms of this business is, okay, is Car I mean, Carvana, I think has its own sort of segment and it's gonna do well with what it does well. But one of the weaknesses of that model is lack of local connection to customers. And that's what 
that that's that that's what guys like Asbury. There's a group of people that will go out and want to have the online experience. Okay, mm -hmm. and having that online experience, that that's great. But then there's also a group of customers that want to have the in person, the test drive, all the traditional. So what I really think both are going to coexist. But I think what we're really seeing now in some of these traditional dealers that have adopted the internet as a way to sell automobiles is we're we're seeing the growth spurt we've seen. Mm -hmm all along now we're seeing a turbocharge these companies and the nice thing about it is the incremental margins are just gigantic because in essence they got to set up an internet internet they'd set up the software internet aspect of it and they're they're, they're not they're not their sales people there isn't much salesperson that really has to do with it and they can interface so it's, it's it's an interesting time for this business so i think the way the way and that's one of the things i really like about the business is that is that going forward people agree that the revenue growth is going to be there. The real mm -hmm. question is, okay, well, what's going to happen to profitability? Now, right. the nice thing about Asbury is that most of its most of its profitability comes from service. So it'll continue to service cars. The big question that people have is, okay, EVs are coming up. What's going to happen with service and EVs? EVs are more reliable than internal combustion cars. You're not going to need oil changes. You're not going to need all these lubricant and mechanical things that are part of the there are part of traditional cars that are associated with the internal combustion engine. A very interesting answer to that. There's, there's two pieces of data I've seen. There's a company in Sweden called Bilia, and there's been EV penetration in Scandinavia has been larger than any other place in the world. And for those companies, what they've actually found is they found service has actually gone up. It's just been different things. Yeah. So in Scandinavia, the tires, for example, tires in all EVs go, go quicker than than, than, than traditional cars because of the additional torque on the wheels. And so that's, that's an example of a growth aspect there. So I think the market seems to be concerned about guys like Asbury sort of in declining businesses, but they've really gone out and really done a lot of stuff to enhance the growth. And what's really interesting is, okay, you got 20%, 20% revenue growth. They've had great operational leverage, which we'll probably get here. So you're probably talking maybe, I don't know, 25% plus EPS growth hmm. selling for less than 10 times earnings. So I think what you've got here is you've got the market conflating what specifically, you know, this business is versus what's really going on underneath the hood. And so I think that's, that's what really makes it interesting from my perspective is that, is that it, right now it's selling for what a value investor would say, Oh, that's a great price. Of course. I, it looks very I, interesting. I think what's going to happen here, like you're saying, you had a good question. Okay, are we at a cyclical top? Well, we may be, but this guy has some more, more gas in the gas tank, per se, and the fact that it's going to continue, I think, to grow from the internet. And then as they continue to do acquisitions, they just did an acquisition at the end of 2020, and that's just being integrated in. And if they get more, it's going to be, it's going to be incremental going forward. So I think overall, they have a really good management team. They're incentivized correctly. And they're, they're, they're in an opportunity, probably very similar to the opportunity that you have with evolution is a lot of these companies transitioning where you can get the internet as part of this, of a traditional market, it creates a lot of growth. And, and that's mm -hmm. exciting for investors because, you know, you know, even as a, even as a value investor, you can see the growth there if it, if it just continues on and moves along. Like right. it has. So, right. That's, uh, you know, I was just curious. I mean, certainly the numbers look, very good. Um, you know, what drives that inventory, high inventory turn for them? And then uh, you referenced a couple of times about acquisitions, the one that they did recently. You know, what sort of typical acquisition multiples um, do they pay? Or how does that compare to where Asbury as a combined entity is trading? Yeah, I, I mean, it, they, they, they buy at multiples probably um, compare, you know, at or slightly below what their current price is, but they're able to take advantage of synergies. They're actually okay. able to actually realize those over time. Um, and they're very, they're very selective. They, and they're looking for, because what's happening is when you think about the dealership market, it's basically run by entrepreneurs that basically started these dealer, dealership businesses after World War II for the most part. These guys are aging out. So the availability of these acquisitions is very, very aperiodic. And right. you have to be there the right place at the right time. So these guys that know their markets that they're in, 
And when one comes available, they'll go ahead and do it. But they also have other options to allocate their capital if an acquisition doesn't happen. And the key things now is the internet aspect of it. And the other key aspect is um, the share buybacks. And historically, if you look at what they've done, they have been bought back significant number of shares when acquisitions haven't been available. And so mm -hmm. they, they do, I think they've got a very balanced capital allocation approach from that perspective. I like the fact that they have a capital allocation committee. Um, I don't see that very often. I own. No, I haven't seen it in any other company, and I think it's 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 a, it's a legacy of there was a guy that used to work for Michael Dell's family office, and he's mm -hmm. head of that committee. He's no longer with Michael Dell's office, but he heads up that committee, and it's it's very interesting. I think the key thing with inventory turns that I've seen in this business, a lot of it really depends upon are the salespeople focused on you know, trying to sell a car, trying to, what you want to do, you want to match what the consumer wants to the car. And if you've been able to figure out how to develop that process and do it in a most efficient way, then that's when the turns are going to start to click. And that's what the model is all about. I think these guys have done a very good job of matching. Okay. I know my customer, here's the car that he or she wants. And that's that. And there's a company actually in China. that's probably the best one that's they have inventory turns of like 15 or 16, but that's wow. what this is. And, and, and that's what I think this business is all about. Retailing in general is all about, right? It's matching, exactly. it's matching consumer to product. And part of it is sort of, you know, when you're dealing with retail, it's more distribution aspect of it too. But, that, but that's a key aspect of getting a high inventory terms is understanding your customer and matching that. And then, and then just having it run through a very efficient sort of um, distribution chain. Yeah. Oh, that sounds uh, pretty interesting. So, so yeah, so th this may be a good transition to your, since you're, you've got a retail name for your next, your next um, presentation here, Shri, this may be a good transition since we're going from car retail to supermarket retail, right? Yeah. Okay. You're right. The uh, next name I want to present is actually a retail name in Poland of all countries, I think, uh, um, you know, Poland may be a little bit of a surprise, but I find the country to be fascinating. Um, it's uh, the company is Dino Polska. It's a uh, it's the fastest growing food retailer in the country, Poland. Uh, Poland has about forty million people. It has a very interesting uh, dynamic, unlike many other uh, fast growing countries. Poland has not urbanized at the same rate, meaning people have stayed back in smaller towns and villages. Urbanization in Poland is only about 60% versus developed countries like US, UK, we are in the mid to high, you know, low to mid eighties. And even fast growing developing countries have you know, mid to high seventies. And so uh, that's a quirk of the country, people stay back. Um, and that sort of uh, plays very well into the hands of, you know, Dino's management team. So what does Dino do? Well, as I said, it's, it's a fast growing retailer. The idea is uh, uh, fairly straightforward. The founder um, set up the company in 99 after selling it to a, after selling a piece of it to a private equity firm, he bought it back and um, has been growing at a breakneck pace. Um, setting up approximately 4,300 square feet box, rectangular box. That's the size of a, a Dino store. Has about 5,000 SKUs. And um, essentially what they offer is proximity to its customer base. They focus on three to 5,000 people. They call it a catchment area. And uh, they set up these uh, boxes in small towns of Poland and uh, focus on three to 5,000 a store. Once a particular store starts attracting more than that, they set up another one just a few kilometers down the road. And um, they've been, as I said, growing at a breakneck pace. Um, the 10-year uh, compounded annual growth rate of the store base alone is about 38%. They currently have about 1,600 stores. And um, it takes about three years for a store to break even. It takes them about a million and a half 
um, to actually set up a store, get it going, um, you know, from the point at which they actually acquire a piece of land, and I'll come back to that in a second, to get it to an operational store, uh, it takes somewhere around two plus years, you know, just about uh, one and a half to two plus years. And so um, within that time frame, it takes about a million and a half or so dollars to uh, get it going. They tend to own all their stores, unlike many of their competitors. And um, most of the competitors, uh, there's a really large competitor by the name of Piedronca. It's actually owned by a Portuguese company, um, Geronimo Martins. It's actually a publicly traded company in Portugal. And they own 100% of Piedronca and they own a few other brands. Uh, they own one in Colombia as well, but uh, that's the biggest competitor. And there's a whole bunch of other players, uh, Little from Germany and um, you know, Lithuanian uh, competitor and a whole bunch of small mom and pop operators in these small towns. Even though I like to go after monopolies and you may say, you know, how is Dino a monopoly? It is from its operational, uh, from its operational angle. You know, it focuses on these small towns where its competitors are these mom and pops and um, bigger stores. They have tried to enter some of these smaller markets, but haven't been as quite as successful. So from that angle, um, you know, if it's not a monopoly, it's uh, pretty close to being one in those small markets. The founder owns about 51% of the stock. Um, he's only 47 years old. He's a very um, reclusive individual. Not many people know more know, know anything about him, but he's very involved with the operations. Um, and uh, from my standpoint, this is a company, this, it reminds me of early stage Walmart back in the 70s and 80s here in the US. And I'll focus on small towns, growing um, within those markets where you know they could handle only one or two stores like that. Very similar dynamic playing out in Poland. And uh, you know I, I see I see a significant growth potential um, going forward. I'm sure there'll be a couple of questions. Go ahead. Can you build up um, some aspects of sort of like say either return on incremental capital or growth or how do you get to their historical growth so at least we can get some insights into what the drivers are there and what you think are the drive are the drivers sustainable in terms of going forward? Yeah. So I've talked to the management team um, and their internal goal is to put up 20% new stores every year. Mm -hmm. And uh, the company actually started from the Western part of the country. So I would say, you know, central West part of the country. And from there, they've been marching East. As you know, you know, the western part of the country juts up against Germany, and the eastern part of the country juts up against Ukraine, Lithuania, and a few other poorer neighbors. And they've been marching east over the last you know, couple of decades now. And, um, and so the internal growth is to put up 20 plus percent. The country is divided into 16 provinces, two in the west, in the central west portion have about 12 stores per 100,000 people. And uh, they believe even in those, uh, while the entire country put together has about 4.3 stores, Dino stores, mm -hmm. that is, per 100,000 people. And so, you know, just the pure math of growing that uh, store base, getting it to, a, you know, to approximately 10 to 12 stores per 100,000, gets them into the mid to, uh, into the low to mid 20% growth per year. And uh, they have done it over a long stretch of time. As we speak, they are sitting on the largest land bank ever in the company's history, which means, which tells you a little bit about the growth that is um, ahead of them. Is and- it, is, uh, it, so is, is all this growth internally funded? Are they to take any, any debt or anything or how, what's their approach to that? Yeah, um, they acquire, first of all, they acquire land from these farmers in these, you know, agricultural towns. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what they kind of translate into their store base. And um, uh, they fund 100% of their earnings of their cash goes back into reinvestment. Uh, they do take on a little bit of debt. You know, it's very minimal, 1.1 times debt to EBITDA at this point. And uh, in fact, they think as they continue to grow, that metric is going to go down. They just raised about uh, billion zlotys just recently. Um, that is to fund their uh, important uh, uh, source of differentiation, which is their own meat processing plant. Back in 2003, they acquired a meat processing plant, which mm -hmm. has given them a significant edge um, where they're able to provide, deliver on a daily basis, fresh meat to all their stores. You know, pork is their most uh, is the most popular meat product in Poland, and um, these guys essentially deliver fresh meat um, to the stores on a regular basis. Biedronka, Little, many of the other bigger competitors, they offer meat, but most of them offer it in vacuum packed, plastic wrapped, um, you know, packages. So that's a significant uh, differentiation factor for them. They have had until recently, until as of now, um, they have had only one plant, meat processing plant to support all these 1600 stores. The uh, capital raise that they just, the debt capital that they just raised um, is to help them build their next second meat processing plant. But overall debt level is very minimal. They fund um, everything internally. And um, that's something that, sets the company apart from many of the other European and even many of the US companies that I've looked at. You know, many management teams will tell you that uh, uh, we are proud of our dividend program. We have maintained this uh, high dividend um, yeah. strategy for a long stretch of time, blah, blah, blah. Um, even evolution has that same uh, dynamic where they have a policy of reinvest of uh, returning 50% of their earnings back as dividend. For a company growing at 50 plus percent, I would rather have them reinvest. Yeah. Uh, but they have their own strategy, they have their own plans. Yeah. And when we come to Dino, they have been very explicit. They've said, um, we are reinvesting 100% of our cash back into the system because we are growing at a very rapid pace. So what kind, of return, really what kind of unit economic returns are they getting when they reinvest in, into the stores? So it takes about three years for a store to um, break even. Mm -hmm. And given the breakneck pace at which they've grown, approximately 50%, approximately 800 of the current 1600 stores are not contributing to the bottom line. And without that, return on cap capital, incremental capital has been low 20% average since 2014. And, uh, and as, I, as you can imagine, because of this um, big um, gravitational pull from the 50% of the stores that are not contributing, that is only going to, that metric is only going to improve meaningfully as time progresses. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, heavy reinvestment, um, incremental uh, return being that high, you know, I think that that sort of leads to this high value creation or intrinsic value creation metric that I look for in all my names. Okay. So one last question, since this is a Polish equity and a lot of people I don't think invest a whole lot in Poland, how is the corporate governance in Poland specifically in this case, what's your assessment of management and how they do stuff and 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 the incentives maybe further down the line above sort of the top guy that this it's running it. Yeah, as always, Keith, you have like three or four questions in that one. I sentence, know, I'm sorry. But I'll address a couple of them. Um, you know, the uh, CEO, the founder, rather, uh, he's the chairman of the supervisory board. He owns 51%. Nobody else has any equity. Uh, it's the policy. It, I own another uh, Polish company, and they also have a similar policy where they don't necessarily distribute equity amongst um, the rest of the management team. Um, so uh, that sort of makes the compensation pr plan fairly straightforward. It's all cash-based. Mm -hmm. And um, 
to address your governance question, you know, Poland in 1990, when Lech Walesa, you know, became the first president, soon after that, uh, the finance minister came out with a big bang policy, opened it up for uh, competition. And ever since, the company has been, the country has been, um, has been a phenomenal success, you know, sitting in the West, you know, we probably haven't had the opportunity to appreciate the kind of growth the country has put up. It's a consistent four plus percent GDP growth rate until COVID hit. And in fact, if you go to my write up, I show an interesting chart from World Bank where, um, you know, Poland is actually the second fastest growing country, second only to South Korea. Um, but the country from a governance standpoint has sort of copied um, or translated much of Germany's governance. And, uh, you know, you may raise questions about Germany's governance based on, um, you know, some of the recent developments in the German market. But um, to a large extent from, uh, from our standpoint, you know, they follow IFRS, they have German governance. It gives me enough confidence that uh, I'm able to get from many of the Western European companies and the US companies. Okay, great. No, that was, that's a real, real interesting company. I'd say, yeah. like, I mean, I, I like those kind of businesses where you've got high, again, that one's got high inventory exactly. times per year. And it basically is just in those types of business. I know here in Rochester, New York, we have a, a store called Wegmans and it's a Look at that. thing. It's got a very, it's a very high turns, it, you know, store that really does really good job. And, and you can, you can do well in something like that, where you don't need to make a whole lot on the margins, but you know, because if you can do turns and you're making the customer happy, like we talked about with cars, it's the same thing here. You got to have your store, have stuff in your store that folks really want, right? And they- Absolutely. I mean, uh, the other interesting aspect here is I like the fact that, you know, uh, Dino Polska actually caters directly to the customer. There is no, um, there is no intermediary, mm -hmm. as in the case of Evolution, where there are, they're selling to the um, operators. Uh, the eventual customers are the customers of the operators. Here, they're going directly to the customers. And um, because of the differentiation factors I highlighted, they're able to control the pricing and um, you know have a dominant position. And yes, many retailers have this very advantageous position of high turn, providing them this negative working capital. Um, and uh, Dino is, is again, a big beneficiary of suppliers funding their operational needs. Very much like Costco, right? I mean, that's the- Exactly. That, it's, it's, exactly. A, it's a, a model on a, on a smaller scale in, in the niche that they really provide support to, so. Yeah. So let's uh, go back to you. And uh, I am very curious to know about your next name. Yeah, so, so the next name we have up here is a company called Millicom. Mm. They are, is there, they provide, it's been described as a Verizon, a Verizon based company. So they've got a lot of wireless in a number of Latin American countries with it, and they're building a charter underneath it. So basically they, they're building out this infrastructure, which is key in most of these countries in terms of providing broadband. So remote in all of their countries, they are they are players in the mobile market, but they are building this, this network. In many cases, they bought the local cable providers and then now are are extending out and putting in fiber where it makes sense. Um, and because and, what's really happened in, in Latin America and in general in, in these sort of fiber companies is the cost to pass homes has gone down quite a bit. And so, um, so, so right now, um, Millicom can pass a home for $100 and the user equipment's about $100. And therefore they can make a very good return on charging, they charge like $30 a month per, per customer per month, which is very affordable in the regions where they are to provide. That was going to be my first question. Is that yeah. an affordable rate? Yeah, yeah. and so, so they're able to get, you know, I think on unlevered returns, they're getting sort of on the, the, the mid to high 20% on an unlevered return. If you, if you, if you, they put, you put the leverage on, you're probably getting like 40% incremental returns based upon, working in that market. Like you're saying, that's been a historical constraint in those markets. 
And why there probably historically hasn't been a lot of growth because historically passing those homes has cost so much. Um, but now the price has come down and we're sort of seeing it in the United States. There's a number of people that are doing it in the United States. Of course, the, right. in the United States is higher. Um, so the returns are also good there, but this one's really happening in Latin America and you do have the growth. The other thing these guys have done well, over COVID, which, is re which isn't even reflected in the pricing and the valuation that I've taken a look at, is, um, is, is they've developed a, a mobile transfer or a fintech type company, mm. which value it on what other fintechs are at is worth the market cap alone. So they have this almost this free option in this business. Um, so what they've done, if you look at the way that the, the company is set up, majority of their profit comes, 67% of their EBITDA comes from markets where there's very few players, where they're one of two people. Their margins are higher as you'd expect in those countries. So, I mean, their two biggest countries are Guatemala and Honduras. And if you look at this, one of the issues that I've historically had with emerging markets types of, of companies, now Poland isn't in this case either, is the, is the currency the currency issue. If you go back, you take a look at Poland over time, it's been flat. These guys, if you go back to 2000, the currency depreciation against US dollars has been like seven per year. It's been very, very low, which to me provides me a lot of comfort because you can find these great businesses in places like Brazil, Russia, Turkey. But then in addition to not only being concerned about the business, if you're a US dollar, yes, to be concerned about the currency depreciation. Which is very, which is something that's totally out of your control, which makes it much more difficult to really find a good bargain there. The bargains have to be so much more of a bargain, and you're dealing with another factor that's out of your control. So, that, that's that's what I found interesting about Millicon is, despite them being in Latin America, the currency has been very very strong versus, let's say, alternatives you could find in Brazil or Mexico or Argentina or other places like that where the currency has gone down. So. You got you get guys that have built this, this this system up. The other thing that's unique about Millicom is their management structure. Mark, the, the guys that's the CEO came from um, BTR, which is basically the Malone Cable Company in Latin America. Oh, yeah. Former CEO of that company, so he's now he's the he's the CEO of this company. They've they've incentivized their managers, which is unusual for an emerging markets company, where all of their managers basically have they have the ownership guidelines. So the CEO has to own five times the salary, the CFO, mm -hmm. times, which is typical for most North American and other companies. But all their, their, their managers of their countries have to own at least 0.5 to one times their salary. And it's interesting because what talking with the company, they've said, you know, these managers are really incentivized to see what's going on with the stock and what can they do to basically increase the stock. And you talk about that app capital allocation decision that's pushed down to these guys. And then they really understand it on a country level. And again, this com country has, company has like little or no dividends, but they've seen so many investment opportunities. So the main thing about this company is, it's generating all this cash flow. Then the question is, where is it gonna go, right? So they have three big areas that they can invest in. They have two, the, the two largest JVs they have, that they own 50, 50% is in Guatemala and Honduras. And, and, and if, they, if that happens, if they, that's that's one that's one of the bigger things. Right. The other one is buying back shares. Mm. Yeah, and if they buy back shares at their current price, you're probably getting about a twenty percent rate of return, maybe thirty percent levered. And then, as we talked about before, in the unit economics for the internet, they're getting they're getting great economics there. So they have a they have a they have cash flow coming in and great choices to allocate it, and they don't need to distribute it out to anybody. So I find it to be a very interesting opportunity. The uniqueness I like about it is the currency has been always been my issue with these foreign right. tech funds, um, but this these aren't in it. They've got number one or number two positions in a number of their uh, a number of their markets. They do have some markets where there is some risk, but they're very very low exposure. So, for example, they've got uh, they're one of the competitors in Nicaragua and Bolivia. Those those the there's more risk there. But what they've actually found in Bolivia is they can get decent returns because at least the government there realizes you're going to have to get, you have to give the companies reasonable returns, but those are much small, smaller portions of the business. The main companies in this business is Guatemala, Honduras, Paraguay, and then, and then Colombia. So are they, are they offering, are they offering these uh, in bigger cities in these countries or are they 
well, playing well, well, in smaller towns, or does that make a difference? In it's 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 all across the country. So I mean, okay. in Latin American countries. So like in Guatemala and Honduras, it's pretty much you know all across the countries. And then in Colombia, it's a, it's a, it's a, they they do have um they're not in they do have a JV with a they're working with with somebody who's big in Bogota, um but they do they're may I see is in Medellin, but they but they do have and the other interesting thing about Latin America, um just like Poland was a very entrepreneurial had very democratic sort of leanings before other parts of the world, Colombia in Latin America is very similar. Yeah. They've been known as the commerce hub of South America. The reason why drugs are so big there is that it's the commerce aspect of the culture and what really goes on there. So that's why it's, I think it's exciting for them to be involved in that market. And they do have a very large investment opportunity there to continue to, you know, they're competing against more state owned type businesses. So they do have some real interesting opportunities there. I think what's happened with them from a story perspective. They used to be a majority owned by Kinovic, which was a very large Swedish conglomerate. Right. Dumped their stock. Okay, this happened in 2008. Then, 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 then so then, then they started, they were traded on the NASDAQ. They started to build stuff up. You can see the revenue goes up. They're starting to turn the corner. And then COVID hit. Now, COVID hit Latin America much worse yeah. than, than the developed market. So that basically just, and so now they're in the process of going. So they were in a process of actually taking off and then they got hit with COVID. And then now what's actually happened is it helped them in the fact that they pulled back investment. And then now they're slowly going back and putting investment into other areas. But I think it really added a lot of credibility to their overall thing because they helped these governments. So these governments wanted to get money out to, to, to individuals mm -hmm. and countries. And they, they provided their, their Tigo money app to basically distribute payments to individuals. I see got a lot of goodwill from the governments by providing this. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting story. I think in combination with that, the pricing right now is around on a look-through basis, probably about seven times free cash flow. So if you add that together, now the other interesting thing about this model is you do have operational leverage. So as you, as other people have noted, the revenue isn't growing that much. That Because the reason that is, is it's a combination of broadband revenue probably growing like eight or 9%. Mm -hmm mobile revenue growing at 2%. Right now, mobile 60%, 60, 65% and, and broadband. So, but if you, if you, if you, what's happening is, is that higher growth, it's, it's switching more over to that, but the operational leverage in this business is very high given the amount, just the nature of the business. So you can turn like a 4% revenue growth into 15% free cash flow growth relatively easily. That's sort of like what they've done. And then you Got it. Top of, if you're seven, well, seven percent free cash flow yields. So you're talking about 20 to 30 percent sort of combined growth and yield you're getting today. And, and to me, that really provides a good sort of the rest of the world in terms of this COVID recovery. So this will provide you another another avenue to basically play that that you know return to stabilization. I mean, one of the risks over this whole thing is is these countries are more, these guys are in a great position. They're building you know critical infrastructure. But, but Latin American countries are going to be more um, susceptible to shocks like COVID. But that's, that's right. Perfect. How do you think about the leverage, though? Financial leverage um, here is much higher relative to your first idea. And I'm just wondering, with the operating leverage being that good, uh, that high, and financial leverage being that high, how do you kind well, of well, well, their focus, their focus has been paying down debt. Okay. Last year, for example, in their joint venture, with, with Guatemala and Honduras, um, they didn't have any dividends, they paid down debt. So their focus now is to focus on the opportunities where they see high return on investment to invest and then pay down debt. And then when they, when they, wanna, they wanna get down to two and a half times AV to EBITDA, and then they said they'll feel more comfortable with, with share repurchases at that point. But I think their focus is correctly now and trying to reduce the debt because if they, because I mean, the amount of cash flow they're getting, they they can reduce that debt relatively. You know, they, they should be able to do that. So I think they really can do both. So I see. Well, that's fascinating. Um, I tend to, you know, we have uh, uh, we're all going at this from a variety of different angles. I tend to focus on companies that have high gross margins. Um, capex as a percentage of gross profit is something that I. Uh, keep a very close eye on. 
And uh, of course, uh, in a retail business like Adino Polska, you can generate uh, terrific gross margins. You know, it's in the mid to high or low to mid 20%, but the evolution mm -hmm. is much, much higher. Um, and uh, in a business like uh, Melicom, um, you know, I wonder how you kind of take this constant CapEx need to continue to grow and CapEx as a percentage of gross profit. Uh, how well, do you come? Yeah, there's really two businesses here. So you really need to break yeah. it between the two, okay? So you've got, you've got um, mobile business, which doesn't require a whole lot of CapEx. To I see. It's growing at a small amount. Then you've got the underlying cable business, which does require CapEx because you're putting in new cables. But the cables you put in there are probably going to be there for 10 or 20 years. The nice thing about fiber is once you lay the fiber, to basically upgrade, you just need to drop in a little bit of electronics yeah. and you get more bandwidth. So they're really building a long-term infrastructure. And so I think if you take a look at it from that perspective, and that's sort of the argument, a lot of the stuff in the United States is, is that, and what I really think is going to happen over time, we don't see it right now because the applications aren't there, but as more and more video stuff happens, it's going to be a huge bandwidth hog. And, and all these huge applications, someone's going to come, when the bandwidth's available, someone's going to come up with this application that everyone needs. It's just going to be, it's going to take tons of bandwidth. And these companies are going to be available to provide that service. And it's, a, in my mind, it's almost like, in these countries, you're building like a railroad when rail, in terms of transportation, that's what you're really- That's fantastic. Yeah, CapEx by itself is, uh, you know, in an energy company, energy uh, ENP, you know, entity, CapEx um, can be significantly high and you will, you will not know what the returns are gonna be. Um, but if this sort of a CapEx is gonna differentiate them and provide that monopoly position, that's, yeah. uh, that's fantastic. That I I I do like that. And, and that. and that I think is the difference. Like you're saying, I mean, with oil and gas, it's difficult because, like you're saying, you're you're investing in a depleting asset. So that's a yeah a real rough game to play. And it's and, a, and the amount of depleting at the amount of cash flow you're going to get out of it's dependent upon the price of oil while 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 your well is producing, right? So if it's high, you're going to do well. If it's low, well, you're not going to not do not so well. So. Well, Fantastic. Yeah. Keith, um, it's always a pleasure uh, chinwagging with you. Um, you did raise a few important questions. I hope I answered them. And uh, I'm sure we'll be talking more and uh, look forward to doing more of this. Yeah, Let's no, ask appreciate Jessica it. to do this more often. No, no, I, I agree. I mean, this is really a good opportunity for us to flush things out and to really provide our, our shareholders and potential shareholders sort of a, a view into the way that we think about investments, which I think is important for all people that do invest in investment managers to understand what the process is, the way that their, their managers are thinking about things and whether that's something that they, that they affiliate with or not. And that, in my mind, that's a, and that's a key thing to basically provide perseverance when things aren't going right to really understand and feel, feel comfortable with that. So I think this is a great step in that process. Appreciate, yeah. appreciate it, Jessica. Appreciate that. Appreciate Thanks it. a lot. Yep.